back after lunch, everybody. Thank you all for coming to this wind power session. We've got some very privileged guests here today. Um, this year we're going to be launching a new community of practice. It's going to be part of the energy community of practice. And the reason that we're doing that is because we've had five or six branches from around the country build one of uh, a certain gentleman's wind turbines. Um, the design is an open source design. It's freely available on the internet. Um, Ten pounds for an instruction manual and it's fully worth it, believe me. Um, I'm from the Sheffield branch and we, we've built one of these wind turbines. Got another member of our group that built it with me and a few others in, in the room here today. Um, my background is I'm a mechanical engineer and in my first year of my doctorate I built one of these turbines and I fell in love with it. I decided that I was going to change the course of what I was doing for my doctorate and, and research these turbines. Um, the direction it's taken has been very interesting so far. There's lots of challenges that have come up. And um, the, the community of practice is designed to, to bring together all of these things that we're doing across Engineers Without Borders in the UK, all of the things that we've done in the different branches, share information, and um, hopefully with the goal of being able to contribute to the technology and make a real, real, real impact on it. Um, that's both nationally and internationally as well. So here in the UK, the turbines provide an excellent opportunity for education for engineering students. Internationally, and also I guess on a certain windy peninsula off the coast of Scotland, they provide the opportunity for people who have never had access to electricity before to get it. Um, whether they're the most sustainable option in the long term, that's a different question to answer, and maybe one we'll address later in the debate today. So an outline for our talk today, it's a bit of a jumbled slide, isn't it? We've, uh, starting off, we've got Mr. Hugh Piggott himself, um, the original designer of the technology. He's going to take us through um, how, how you can make small-scale wind happen in, in developing countries around the world. We've also got V3 Power, who have helped out a number of the branches around the UK, including Sheffield, to build one of these wind turbines ourselves. After this, we've got Matt Little, who is a former EWB placement volunteer, and as I understand of today, a former trustee as well. Um, he's going to be talking about his experience with Sabat in the Philippines. Then we'll be on to the EWB branches. Um, I'm included in that part of the panel as well and we'll be telling you about how we got on building wind turbines in our own branches. After that, it's an open discussion where anyone is free to ask questions to members of our panel and indeed members of the, the branches that have come here to share their experiences as well. Finally, we'll finish with how can you get involved. After seeing this, I'm hoping that some other people may be inspired to build a wind turbine themselves or else, somehow else get involved with the technology. So. That's enough for me. I'm going to pass it over to Hugh Piggott himself. Hi. Well, I should... Yeah, I'm very privileged to, to be here um, and uh, slightly in awe um, of the situation. But uh, what I'm going to talk about is, is my experiences, um, hoping that that will help you um, with yours in, uh, in small wind turbine development. Um, I live on a remote peninsula in the northwest of Scotland. I basically dropped out in the 1970s and went back to the land uh, initially not using any electricity, um, which was fine, apart from my tape machine to listen to the Grateful Dead. But um, after a while you began to realise that there was some benefit in having a little bit of electricity and it's remarkable how valuable even a tiny little bit of electricity can be um, as compared to having the, the masses and masses of it that we have in our daily lives. Uh, in the developed world. Um, for example, if you can even just charge a mobile phone, that's worth an enormous amount. This is one of the things that I learned from, from living without electricity. Um, and the other key thing that I think has to be borne in mind when you think about wind technology is you have to live in quite a windy place. Um, Sturig is a very exposed location uh, on the northwest coast. The whole coast is very windy. Um, so if you're without electricity and you want to make it yourself, um, you go to the best local resource, which might, might not be wind. You know, most places it's not going to be wind, might well be hydro, might be solar, uh, might be a steam engine, I don't know. But uh, in my case it was wind, so that's how I became the wind power expert. 
um, through a need for electricity. Um, where I live, there's no grid, and I, I chose that. That's the way I want it to live. Um, there's no road access. Uh, we come and go by boat. And um, it's a very beautiful place. Um, and I have a lot of neighbors who also need electricity. So it was a perfect breeding ground for developing um, simply constructed small wind turbines, uh, which were quite fashionable in the 70s. Um, but what I did find was I was quite surprised um, that they do seem to be quite unreliable, which initially I put down to my own incompetence. Um, but uh, actually, the more I've been in the industry, um, the more I've realized that it seems to be almost an intrinsic factor with small wind turbines, that you will get an awful lot of um, cock-ups and uh, breakdowns and aggravation of one sort and another, uh, which uh, is kind of offset by the sexiness of the technology in such a way that people find it addictive. I certainly find it addictive. Um, the more they went wrong, the more I wanted to fix it and the more I wanted to uh, persevere and get a result. Um, so this is some of my early... Um, early experiments. That was my first wind turbine on the roof, a bicycle bicycle dynamo generator on the roof. Don't do this at home, folks. Rooftop wind turbines are definitely a bad idea. Um, it's not a good place to find wind um, on a rooftop. You really want to be well above surrounding obstacles and well away from the building. There's a lot of problems with noise, structural damage and safety. Good wind turbines on the roof on a good windy site. So, um, I don't recommend that. We experimented with single bladers. We tried all kinds of different things. In the end, um, I started using old dynamos off Champ Jeeps um, for modification to get a suitably low speed generator. The real challenge is to get a, uh, a type of generator that works at low RPM and has a very good part load efficiency. And this was quite a challenge in those days. Um, it wasn't such a challenge initially to put them in a good windy spot, but um, as the trees grew, it became more and more important to put them on tall towers. And uh, we developed low-cost technology using steel water pipe and fencing wire, uh, which has proved very, very reliable and effective for, uh, for getting up there into decent winds with your wind turbine. Um, when I'd, uh, when I'd been working for a while on Scorig, I started to get more of a more of an interest in what went on in the rest of the world, and uh, that, what that led to in the end was a, a project in Africa, in Zimbabwe, where um, where I was asked to design a wind turbine for low wind speeds. So we went for a 3.6 meter diameter. It was going to be a 500 watt machine, which is a very low rated power design for low wind speeds. Um, and in fact, the, the design was taken up by the people who built the prototype and they started manufacture. But um, as with so, so often with these projects, which are intended for purpose of providing rural electrification for the indigenous people there, um, this actually went off at a different angle. And uh, the main motivation of the company who manufactured them was to generate export income, um, dollar, dollar exchange income, um, which they did successfully for a while. Uh, but it, it, it didn't actually translate into um, any improvement for the local people's lives. Um, this is some examples um, of the uh, AWP, the African wind power machine. It had a, a radial flux alternator, and the, um, what became most obvious during that particular development project was that it was very, very difficult to manufacture the, um, which is about the uh, laminations at the center of the alternator were very, uh, very, very difficult things to manufacture um, in a low-tech sort of environment. Uh, in fact, we had a, a small engineering firm in the capital city, Harare, were still struggling to manufacture these laminations, even though they, they manufactured inverters and battery chargers for sale. Um, so what I learned about alternator design for simple um, hands-on uh, access to, to the ability to manufacture these things without special tools was that um, much preferable was to use an axial flux design, sort of pancake design as it was once known, where the, the alternator is between two steel discs that have magnets. Um, the, the, uh, the engineering is simpler because you're working with flat planes rather than cylinders for a start, and you don't have to manufacture these very complex laminations. 
Um, and with the progress of development of permanent magnets over the last couple of decades, they've become cheaper and cheaper and stronger and stronger. That's meant that we now have a situation where you can just throw together something with uh, some pieces of steel plate, some of these magnets, some copper windings and a car, um, car wheel hub, and you've got a perfect generator for a low-speed uh, wind turbine um, that pretty much anyone can build. And uh, this is a tremendously empowering experience that I think a lot of people in this room may have already encountered, the, the, the experience of actually using your own hands to put together something that will then generate electricity in moderate wind speeds. You don't need a howling gale. Um, and it's something that I've enjoyed sharing with people enormously. So ITDG, who've now become Practical Action, hired me to design alternators for a couple of projects in Sri Lanka and in Peru. And for that, I used this uh, axial flux design. Um, what was noticeable really about these projects with Practical Action um, was that they were very high budget. Um, I enjoyed the process because I, I was paid well and traveled and, um, and, uh, and was able to develop my design ideas. Um, what, what was more disappointing was what actually happened um, in, in, the, in the aftermath, really. Um, maybe a couple of dozen wind turbines were built in, in Sri Lanka and possibly a few more in Peru. But, um, but somehow the goal of changing the world with small wind turbines um, didn't really materialize immediately. And I think this is something that, um, that people are beginning to focus on now is how to, how to look beyond the, the simple technology and, and start to look at the process of technology transfer and more at the, the commercial side of things and the social side of things, making the wind turbine into something that people can understand, make it into something that people will be willing to buy rather than buying kerosene for lighting making it into something that they'll be able to find somebody who can repair it, and making it into something that will compete with solar PV. Uh, and that requires a, a windy site. It requires local understanding of the technology um, and uh, the ability to deal with all the problems of small wind energy. Um, I started in the year 2000 teaching courses, and I've been doing so for the last dozen years or so. And, uh, what I have found is that it's a, it inspires people to build a small wind turbine, it excites them, and, um, and so it's an ideal project for universities, also for schools, um, and even in the developing world for engaging people with engineering at a very basic level. Um, you say, well, this is how we build a wind turbine, and then you get their attention, and they, they want to learn how to uh, carve wood, they want to learn um, how an electrical generator works. And, uh, and so it's an enormously empowering experience. There was a project with Enterprise Works in Ghana, and, and how are we doing for time? Uh, doing it right. We've yeah. got maybe five, seven now. Perfect. Um, working with Enterprise Works in Ghana, um, I, it seemed a much more professional approach to development. Than, um, than working with Practical Action. I don't know whether Practical Action have matured since they were ITDG, but Enterprise Works had a very, very commercial um, insight into the aid um, process. They, they would start off with a sustainable design, a simple design that could be manufactured that would change people's lives, a pedal powered irrigation pump or a um, charcoal burning stove. And, uh, and then the, the first step was training. Um, they got me in to train 20 technicians. It wasn't just a case of a proof of concept in a workshop with one or two guys. We were training people with all different skills. Um, they then had the budget to uh, pay these people to build quite a number of machines and to put them out on test sites and evaluate the response. And if they'd had the funding to continue with that, um, a follow-up project would have invested in TV advertising for the product. Um, quality control over what was sold so that the people who actually got the, the sales would be the ones that delivered quality stuff um, that, that actually worked at a reasonable price. Uh, and then when the, when the market launch had been nursed along to the point where it became able to stand on its own feet, then, then you would be able to see a result that could carry itself forward and, and uh, look after itself. Um, <laughs> But without that sort of support throughout the, the whole process of launching the technology, um, we're really just fiddling about, to be honest, um, with, the, 
we're trying to uh, solve the problems of rural electrification using wind energy. Um, it's, it, it, the, you do need a bit of joined up thinking in order for these projects to be successful. In Ghana, there is still um, Emmanuel Okanzi, who I believe still does manufacture and in his little shed, he'll, he'll make uh, one or two of these wind turbines a year. But this, hopefully, we can look to greater things than this at, at some point in the future. <coughs> Around the world, there have been a number of groups who, who've, um, who, who, who've been teaching courses similar to mine. In France, Trapalium teach uh, a lot more courses than I do, maybe uh, 15, 20 courses a year. They do a lot of grid-connected machines, a lot of enthusiasm for the technology in France, not so much for development purposes, but just for the sake of it. Uh, similarly in Colorado, other power um, have built much larger versions, um, and they, they are also teaching quite a lot of courses. Um, I was very excited by Blue Energy, who went to Nicaragua with the intention of developing a small wind manufacturing process there. Um, I felt this is really what we need. We need continuity. Uh, we need people on the ground who are going to stay there and who are committed. Um, and, and they did, to their credit, um, stay there. But I think what they learned in the process was that they'd chosen the wrong place for wind energy. And that's a lesson that you really need to watch out for. Uh, the Caribbean coast of Nicaragua is not actually windy enough. So although they had plenty of people with no electricity, plenty of motivation, they, they didn't have the wind. Um, they also had a fairly challenging tropical environment, which made it very, very difficult to be successful with the technology. So it's not easy. Um, certainly worth looking at the lessons that have been learned by, for example, Blue Energy in the process of trying to bring this technology to the developing world. Um, together with a number of groups who, who have been um, attempting to set up uh, local manufacturers, small wind turbines, we've established a network called Wind Empowerment. Uh, the website's windempowerment.org. Um, this is the map page where you can, if you click on world map, then you can see uh, anywhere in the world, you can see where the local groups are who are engaged in this sort of technology. Um, there's also a calendar of events and, um, and there's a, a, a lot of links. And uh, it's intended as a, as, a, as a network, as a means for people to find opportunities to get involved and uh, to solve their problems by um, pooling R&D efforts and so forth. So in conclusion, I'd just like to introduce you to Wind Empowerment. And if you're interested in using these sort of, uh, this sort of technology for development work, then um, I urge you to get involved and, and uh, join Wind Empowerment and um, see what you can do. Thanks very much. We haven't got any slides, we're just chatting. Um, so my name's Aaron Eels, um, and I'm going to carry on the story a little bit from Hugh as to how um, his turbine got involved with EWB and the first branch project that was um, involved with the construction of one of his, his turbines. So I studied mechanical engineering at Nottingham University in 2005. I got quite disenchanted with it, really. It's uh, it quite boring, it's quite analytical, and didn't really have any practical sense to it. Um, luckily I got introduced to a lecturer who told me about this organisation called Engineers Without Borders, which sounded great. I went on a placement to Sri Lanka and worked on microhydro and plastic recycling. On returning back to Nottingham, I helped set up the branch with um, a guy called Drew Corbin. Is he here? Did he make it? Oh, I wanted to point him out. Um, so we, we set up EWB Nottingham and in the first meeting, there was a PhD student called Hugh Burnham Slipper, if I remember his name for obvious reasons, and he said, let's do something practical, like build something, maybe a wind turbine, um, we can use like a car alternator, and let's just build something practical. So this sounded great, all thumbs up, um, and then having a chat to one of the EWB trustees, he said, oh, have you heard about this guy? He lives um, on a peninsula in Scotland, and he's written a book, How to Build a Wind Turbine. Um, and we looked him up and found Hugh Piggott, and my life has been irreversibly changed since buying this book, which is now referred to as the Bible. So, we, uh, there were 16 of us in the group. Um, we bought the, the book, which um, John said is, is open source. Um, 
you could have quite easily tried to make a lot of money out of this, but it's very cheaply available. The instructions are all in there, um, and it's very simple to follow. It uses uh, simple ch tools, materials that can be used, that can be found locally anywhere in the world. Um, so we set about um, gathering the materials and starting to build it. Um, three groups, the, the blades group had fun, we cut a few of our fingers, we chose oak as the uh, wood to, to carve, uh, which we now know is a very bad decision because it's very dense and took us a good eight weeks to try and chunk through that. Um, the alternator went very well, Drew had experience from F1 student, junior formula student um, in fibreglass, so he had quite a nice finish on that. The engineering labs didn't let us use any of the welding equipment, so we had to go to a local college and got that welded. So um, we were close to having a finished wind turbine. As Hugh said, it's an amazing project to, to really apply any engineering skills that you've got into something practical. And there's just something magic about um, gathering some materials that are mostly from scrapyards or, or cheap bits that you can find about, putting them all together, and at the end of it, you can get electricity out from something that you've built. It's, it's really an empowering process, and we're, we're all very happy with it by the end. So, then comes to two days before my last exam, should have really been revising, instead I decided to go out to a party. Um, late in the early hours, I came across a guy um, called Tom Dixon, who's sitting here. We had a chat, um, told him about the wind turbine that was just built, and made a decision to, what we're we doing after uni, no one really knows, why don't we start an organisation, start a company that builds these wind turbines. Um, legend has it that he ran down the stairs saying, the future's changed, I've met a guy that builds wind turbines. And um, that has happened. We, we started an organisation called V3 Power, uh, which Tom's going to tell you about in a minute. Um, and that's, that's been my life since, since graduating, really. Um, as a quick update to what happened to that first turbine, um, we put it up at a, a festival on the university, uh, which gathered a lot of interest. Um, and then we took it to quite a few other festivals around the country, showing off that you can, you can do this, you can build turbines yourself. Um, the alternator itself I took to Pakistan, uh, which is now installed in a university over there. The blades we had up at a festival on a display stand and um, we hadn't tethered it and a gust of wind came and they snapped, which was very sad, the first set of blades. And the alternator, the, the mounting is still in the workshop. I want to scrap it, but I want to keep it for sentimental reasons. So, um, yeah, I'll pass you over to Tom to talk about what you think how. So, as Aaron said, we took that turbine and tried to make it make a bit of money, but let us get around to lots of events and, and uh, promote that people make their own turbines. Um, and pretty quickly, people started sort of saying, oh, you know, how, how do you make one of them? We referenced them to the book, but we realised that there was this sort of viable business of um, running courses, because although people might have their own shed um, and certainly they can buy the book themselves, people were quite daunted about getting all the materials together and some of the tools, although they are quite common tools, some of them are a bit specialist and, and we had a role to play of, of getting those things together and making it a lot easier for people to sort of do what everyone can do, but um, helping them do it for themselves. So we've been doing that for uh, about seven years now, um, over which time we sort of tried to keep a running total of it, but we've run around 50 courses. Um, with age ranging from sort of right down to school kids making smaller turbines than this one here. This, for, this isn't actually a cubic sort of design turbine, but um, things a bit smaller than that, you can sort of knock together quite quickly and easily. And then up to the university based stuff, which we've done in the UK and quite a bit in Germany, but <coughs> with EWB branches, which you're going to hear from the three of them a bit. Um, and those tend to be spread out over around three weekends. Uh, we sort of split it up. Uh, so we'll go down and use the facilities that the university already has, um, which can often be quite a bureaucratic nightmare, getting sort of health and safety assessments during time and stuff like that. But once you do, you've got a really lovely surrounding workshop to, to build um, a good piece of good engineering. Um, and then, hopefully, before that all starts, we've, we've sorted out somewhere for it to go, because at the end of um, Aaron's experience at Nottingham, they had this wonderful turbine, and then everyone graduated and left, and the turbine was in a cupboard, and I sort of swept in, what are you doing with that turbine? And started V3 from that, but often the branches haven't necessarily thought through what to do with it, so our sort of stuck response has started to become now that we're not sort of as interested in going into, into unis to, to do a build until there's a place to put it afterwards. Um, there's an educational sort of 
merit in having the turbine there, um, uh, having, it, having it being built, because people then go off with the skills and, and they've learned quite a lot. But we've started getting a bit guilty about the embodied energy. Um, if the turbine, uh, using all these well, lovely, super strong magnets shipped in from China, it should then just sit in the cupboard uh, and maybe get brought out once a year to be put on a display stand. Um, it's slightly irresponsible, given that those materials could be up somewhere else doing something um, far more important, generating electricity. So we've yeah, got quite a few more projects on, on, uh, of building them in, in the pipeline, but they, um, they've all already tied up what's going to happen with the turbine afterwards. So if your branches are interested in doing it, um, with a view to taking the skills abroad and, and into the develop, development context, <laughs> I urge you to try and also work out a local use of a turbine that you do build, or any of the technologies that you're sort of building to learn about them. Uh, trying to find something that they can do a bit closer to home that's going to be more useful than just collecting dust and being, as I say, dragged out for demonstrations and stuff. Um, but yeah, that's us. We're a renewable energy co-op based in Nottingham. Um, so it's a workers' co-op model. Uh, there's no bosses. Um, and we all make decisions collectively as to what we want to do with the company. Um, and yeah, if you're interested in uh, potentially at the end of your sort of degrees, um, we, we are a, a UK-based wind turbine manufacturing co-op. So uh, do get in touch and, and chat with us whether you want to do a, a course with your branch or, or just want to maybe get involved with a co-op um, outside of the UWB branches. That's us. That's what I talk about. <laughs> Um, my name's Matt Little, um, and I'm going to talk about my experience with uh, small wind turbines in the Philippines, um, and a little bit about how I got to this position, and why I did that, and what I'm doing now. Um, I am an electrical engineer, um, and I was uh, researching at the Centre for Renewable Energy Systems Technology, which is in Loughborough University. Um, and I was researching off-grid, uh, standalone power supply systems. Um, so I was kind of doing quite academic stuff and setting up um, uh, test sites to, to look into off-grid power supply systems. And uh, coming up to the end of my research, and I realised I've never actually lived without electricity. Um, and I was uh, thinking, you know, that's a bit weird. You know, I can't, why, how can I write all this stuff about off-grid power supply systems? I've never actually lived off-grid um, or thought about it. You know, actually done some work in a, uh, for development. Um, so I uh, heard about Engineers Without Borders um, just towards the end of my research um, and uh, heard, uh, went down to Cambridge to see one of their placements launch and within about um, two months I had secured the placement in the Philippines for, um, with SIBAT, uh, which is a Filipino NGO. Um, I think Andrew might have mentioned them already this morning because he was there around Christmas. Um, SIBAT stands for Sibol Nang Agham At Technologia, which is the uh, growth of science and technology. Um, they actually were a farmers group, um, so it's a whole load of farmers who wanted to try and um, you know, make a bit more money from the farming that they were doing. They were subsistence farmers. And they got together and eventually this group, um, SIBAT, has um, looked at creating more sustainable farming methods. And then from that, once you're producing um, more crops, you need to get it to market and you need to sell it somehow. Uh, in order to do that, you need additional forms of energy. So SIBAT had actually got involved with supplying rural electrification projects. Um, they'd started with uh, hydropower. Um, they'd also done some uh, um, solar photovoltaic systems. Um, and they'd also started to look at small wind turbines. Um, there's me, uh, we're talking about electricity being very useful. Uh, this is me actually in the hydro site. Um, but you can see the kerosene lamp at the front there. So this is from about six o'clock onwards in the evening. This is how you have to sit around and do things with a kerosene lamp, incredibly smoky, very expensive way of, um, and a small LED light bulb would have changed all that. A little bit of electricity could have changed that scene. So it's, uh, just, uh, um, we, uh, <laughs> So Sivat were looking at um, huge design for the uh, wind turbine. Um, there had been a VSO volunteer there, a guy called Hugo, and he had built a 500 watt um, Hugo wind turbine and he'd installed it in a community in the north of the Philippines. Um, but his time as a VSO volunteer finished. Um, he came back and had been chatting to EWB and eventually Drew Corbin, who 
was with Aaron at Nottingham. He went on the first uh, Engineers Without Borders placement to um, sit back in Philippines. And he'd done a great job before I'd got there. I, I went after him for the year after. Uh, he'd gone, done a great job. He's a mechanical engineer. And he'd um, started getting this turbine, working on all the mechanical aspects and getting them produced. Mainly getting them produced in Manila, in the city centre, and then taking them to more remote communities to be installed. Um, so when I arrived, uh, I kind of hit the ground running. There was a wind turbine being installed. Um, and within about a week of arriving in the Philippines, I was out in a small community on an island. I'll show you the wind turbine in a second. Um, and I was helping install that. So quite an amazing experience to, to go from kind of academic research environment to actually be helping putting up one of these wind turbines. Um, so uh, there's a few details. Um, before I arrived there, there had been, uh, this is the 500 watt wind turbine installed by Hugo of VSO. Um, so that was already installed, but it's been struck by lightning, unfortunately, so it was actually out of action. Um, this was in uh, Lamag, which is in the northern Philippines, um, on a mountainside. It's about two hours' walk from the local, um, the nearest kind of town. Uh, um, and it was used to electrify a church building. Um, it was installed in March 2006. So there's a close-up of the wind turbine. That's the... Uh, small church um, and uh, it was actually designed to really just do the lighting and maybe have a small amount of um, uh, electricity for other uses. So we, um, it had been hit by lightning so one of the things that I did when I was on my placement was go up there and um, help to repair it um, and as soon as we had kind of got it set up pretty much everyone came out of the woodwork to plug in their mobile phones and get them all recharged. So within about a second of having a power adapter out, it was filled full of mobile phones charging. And I was like, why, how, why is everyone, you know, how did people do this before? Why, why is it so popular? And uh, before, people would have had to walk about an hour um, to a place where a guy had a generator and he'd run his generator. And um, it cost 15 pesos to get your phone charged, which is 15p, but most incomes for a ha household in this area was about 20 pounds a month for a ha full household. So 15p to recharge your phone every few days. Um, and also an hour walk there, wait for your charge, phone to be charged, hour walk back. So having a small amount of electricity locally was um, quite interesting. Um, to start with, we were looking at kind of having kind of free energy, but then we realized actually you can't do that because people will just kind of drain the batteries. So we then started to have to charge to, um, to recharge mobile phones and things like that, but we would make it cheaper than um, the having to go so far to recharge your phone. The other thing that did happen as soon as we had this, they wanted to watch some uh, CDs, uh, DVDs, um, and we're in a place with no electricity, and three DVD um, machines and a TV came out of people's houses. So I was like, what? Got no electricity, why have we got all this stuff? But it's all kind of on show to kind of say, yeah, we've got a DVD. No electricity, for it, but we've got a DVD player. It's quite... Uh, the other wind turbine, um, so this is the one that was installed just as I arrived, um, was in uh, City of Buli on Lubang Island. Um, it's a large machine, a one kilowatt turbine, which was the, the machine that they were kind of standardizing on, um, the one that Drew had done the mechanical designs for. Um, you can also see uh, down the bottom here, there's a few um, solar panels, so there's 300 watts of solar on that. And, um, with Sibat's projects, they, uh, they always talk to the community about what the community would like the energy to be used for. Um, and in this particular case, um, access to water was seen as one of the major challenges. Um, so this kid here is, um, I think he's a he's eight or nine, and uh, he carries his family's water. I think it's about a kilometre. He lives away from where the actual water is, at the well. Uh, and he does it about four times a day. Obviously, I lifted up this thing and kind of probably fell over because it's really heavy. <laughs> and he was just running around doing that all day. So one of the um, reasons for installing this uh, system was to try and provide um, water. Um, so firstly, not to have to raise it from the well, and secondly, put it into a header tank to then supply the community buildings. Um, hasn't fully happened, but um, that's quite a long story behind that. But uh, at the moment... Um, Unfortunately, this wind turbine has been hit by a typhoon. It's not in action at the moment, but um, it's life. Um, 
some more details um, about the actual system. So this is the electrical system. So uh, when I arrived, um, the mechanical stuff had all been sorted out quite well, but um, it's a one kilowatt wind turbine and it had been de designed to run at 12 volts. So um, there were issues with the fact that, if anyone knows uh, a little bit of the electricity calculations, so that's about 100 amps flowing through the wires in that, which means that everything has to be really heavy, really big wires. Basically, we should really have put a higher voltage on the wind turbine so um, we could use thin wires. So that was one of the problems that we, we overcame by, we rewired a few things. Um, there's also a small powerhouse that got built. Uh, the guy in front of that is Carlo, who is the engineer, electrical engineer that I worked with. Uh, this was the temporary water storage system that we set up um, with a view to eventually getting a header tank. Um, one thing that's interesting to note is that um, it's not just about the wind turbine. Uh, wind turbine is one part of a, a system, a power system. Um, so uh, we have the wind turbine. Um, there also the tower is, is very important, um, making sure that that's um, going to survive the conditions that you're putting it in. Also, the electrical system um, is also very important. Um, if the electric electrical system breaks for some reason, then your wind turbine can overspeed and it can then cause mechanical damage to the wind turbine, which is exactly what happened in um, Bouley. Um, the uh, charge regulator um, wasn't quite rated for the right um, for the currents, the high currents that were flowing through it, and it got very warm. It eventually failed, and when it failed. The wind turbine over sped and one of the blades flew off. Uh, not a good thing, but uh, you learn from it, which is what it's all about. And in terms of cost, um, these systems, about one third of the cost is the actual physical um, turbine, about a third the cost is the tower, and about a third the cost is the uh, electrical system, give or take a bit. Um, also, you've got to transport it there. This, these systems are very remote, rural places, so you have to transport them. Um, one thing that I was very interested in um, was uh, monitoring systems. Um, I don't know if you can see, but to start with, there was a voltmeter put on it, um, and it was very difficult to read. So I worked on a, an expanded scale voltmeter, which was easy to build in that area. Um, and it gave you a bit more information, a bit more knowledge about the system, um, which is something I'm now working on um, further as um, my own consulting work. Um, just a few of the challenges, oh, I think this was going to say problems and challenges. Um, challenges that, and things that came up when I was uh, visiting a lot of these sites. Um, firstly, uh, fusing, I don't know if you can see here. Um, so fuses, again, cost about 50p to replace, but again, you have to walk a few hours to get to your market, make sure that they're in stock there. Um, so generally, if you're in a remote place and you want to just get something working, you, you don't bother. Um, you wrap a cigarette, packet, uh, cigarette foil packet around your fuse, plonk it back in, and uh, you get it working for a little bit until it breaks again, and then you've got no fusing to protect anything. Um, lots of crazy wiring, always good to see. Um, very crazy wiring, always nice. Um, we had a few different things that went wrong, some things burned out. Um, just trying to show these as kind of challenges. There is still a, a lot of work to do. Um, and this is where Engineers Without Borders comes in. We can look at how to modulise this, how to make it more sustainable, and also how to train people about what the problems are and how to address them before they maybe happen again. Uh, we had an insects that seem to like to live in absolutely everything, and they seem to really enjoy eating wire, which is a bit weird. Um, and as I said, lightning. So this was a uh, wind turbine, 500 watt wind turbine. Um, it was struck by lightning. Um, maybe not a great statement considering it was on a church, but um, it's uh, hit by lightning. I don't know if you can see the damage there, but lots of stuff just vaporised, um, and it's, it's very difficult to protect against that. You're in a, the Philippines is um, a place where you get a lot of lightning, you get typhoons, tropical storms coming past. So there's another thing to work on, lightning protection. A um, few other challenges. Um, a lot of systems have battery failures. Um, Flooding, floods for a lot of the systems, um, access to spare parts, we need to make sure these things are kind of locally sourced and people are trained to be able to repair pretty much any part of it. Um, I went over there as obviously like a, an engineer thinking of technology, we can solve everything with a bit of technology, um, but the vast majority of the issues that I came across were social issues, um, funding, uh, political situations, um, training, um, that kind of um, stuff, rather than actually the technology. 
Um, so I think that's about me done. This were the guy, these were the guys in, um, in Bully, and the guy in the middle is Drew, who unfortunately I don't think he's made it today, but uh, okay, that's uh, been finished. Okay. of our panel. So now we're going to hear some experiences of um, Engineers Without Borders branches right here in the UK. So we're going to go in alphabetical order. If we could have Bath up first. Yes. Hello everyone. We are from the University of Bath branch. Um, we got the idea from Warwick, so uh, when we launched uh, the idea, we got like a lot of students really interested, so we had to have a selection, and we chose 30 students um, studying different courses, not only engineering, also physics, chemistry, and maths, um, so from every department. Um, we asked V3 for help, so um, the, the, the whole project was um, on three weekends, and we built a uh, one kilowatt wind turbine. Um, funding was a little bit of, um, was hard, was the hardest part. Uh, luckily we got funding from various departments in the, in the universities and the alumni fund. Um, the, the wind turbine characteristic is, well, you can see it from the pictures, three meters diameter, 800 watts and 48 volt voltage per stator and 10 meter high. With the um, bills, it's worth noting we actually got involved with all parts of the bills. We didn't sort of split up um, into the three teams. Over the three weekends, we sort of rotated from you know carving the blades to welding the, the frame, and then you know building the, the stator itself. So you get a lot of hands-on experience, and you really do learn learn a lot. Um, it's can't really emphasize enough, you know, how it's quite um, sort of exhilarating, you know, putting your, your knowledge into practical use, um, like Aaron and Hugh said, sort of building something with your own hands, because you can then, you know, get electricity from really is quite empowering. We have a problem right now, because we're waiting for the planning commission to put it up, because Bath Council is really keen on having the city as pretty as possible. Um, so we are still waiting. Um, in the meantime, well, we have um, we have a blog where we keep updating the situation, and also we put we put pictures about what we did, and we are trying to organize um, promotion and other fundraising to um, to maintain the wind turbine as it is right now. Okay. Yeah, uh, just building on Tom did mention it earlier, um, if you are thinking of an install wind turbine at the university, it is definitely worth trying to find somewhere to install it first. We, so we had a few locations, um, different locations to be assessed. Um, we didn't quite realise how much red tape we'd have to go through to get it installed. It was coming up for a year ago, the voice came down and um, we made it. And it's, it's quite a long process getting the university to agree to it and the council and Fingers crossed, hopefully in the next few weeks we still get final approval, but um, again, it's worth looking into that first as well. But yeah, it was great fun. <laughs> so, so, um, great. Thank you very much. Next up, we've got Bristol. Um, so, yes, yeah, similar to Bath, I mean, we were inspired really by, by Bath and Sheffield and what they'd been doing before. And like them, we had an enormous amount of support. I think maybe 100 people came and signed up to a Facebook group or came to the first meeting. So the first thing to really kind of nail out was what do we want to do with our turbine? We can't just sort of start doing something uh, with a vague idea or sort of conflicting ideas. So the first thing was, we're a development charity. We want to build something that we can make from simple, readily available materials. So using our skills to turn something simple into something that's incredibly valuable. Um, it's got to have a significant amount of power out so it could be used for something useful. And um, it should be, well, initially we thought it could be placed in a visible location and act as a positive symbol for green energy and for energy in general, so helping support the aims of EWB and of the university itself. 
Um, similar to Bath, we identified some research opportunities with the turbine, for example, supercapacitors and um, other opportunities. Um, so, yeah, a huge amount of people um, got interested in the project. So, we quickly split it down into four groups so, uh, mech and aero parts, electrical, siting, sponges of publicity. So, each area would focus on the individual tasks. Um, unlike Bath, we didn't actually select the people for that. We found that although there were initially about sort of 70 people coming along, that easily whittled down in terms of the people that would commit to going to the meetings and commit to actually putting some time into it. Um, progress in the project. Um, so as I said, it's naturally been down to a core group of committed people. Um, we're currently identifying and sourcing all the components for the turbine, and siting is currently by far our biggest issue. We initially wanted to put it in the university, near the university, so that's why there's a dedicated team looking into all the options available. Um, unfortunately, we haven't got final site yet. We're talking to the University of West England as well and looking at export opportunities. But we've made the decision to actually continue building the wind turbine despite the fact we haven't got a final location in order to keep the interest going, the motivation going within the project group. Um, so yeah, it's unlikely we'll finish the project this year. So it's important obviously to have a clear hand over structure. And I'm lucky there are quite a lot of freshers who are very committed and very involved. So I'm hoping they'll step up to the challenge next year as well. Um, any questions from anyone about the project at all? I think I've probably got more questions than answers in my presentation, but thank you very much. Cheers. Hi there, um, I'm John. Um, I didn't build the wind turbine, but I'm here on behalf of our teams to chat about it and conversations in the pubs over what went wrong. So hopefully I will um, divulge the information. Um, the first thing that came out of all my conversations was planning. Um, if you organise for 20 or so people, which you got to, to turn up at a weekend and you don't have every single material and it's out of town location, and you have five or so people turning up and they don't get something to do, it can be quite frustrating. So I think uh, the best thing is to make just double check, triple check, you have everything, you've got something for people to do. Because those five people then didn't turn up the next week. So that was, that was the first thing that came out of it. Um, we were fortunate to have Hertha, who you must, you must know. Hertha has worked with V3 I think for a year or so. She did her industrial placement for us. Yeah, but she did her placement and she's worked on um, other technologies and she was in Edinburgh. So we had a local person, local expertise come and babysit us through the entire thing, which was fantastic. So if you have the pleasure of the company or someone from V3, you know, get them along because they just know that unique bit of information that will set you back a week. Um, what else? They're having a team. so. Obviously, you end up with about 15 to 20 people, but if you can just choose four people who can head up, then you don't have to worry as the sort of head of this project to you know, organize everybody, you, like, you delegate out. And that's obviously part of engineering, is that you delegate, you have teams. So again, bringing in all these sort of skills and things. Um, problems, yeah, the time and coordination. Yeah, the blades. The blades took forever, apparently, and apparently it takes a very long time. Um, we ended up with some plastic ones after a while, and then we, after three or four weeks, so we had a presentation, and for the presentation we couldn't use the wooden ones. Um, so I think it just takes, it always takes a little bit longer than you expect. Um, so expect to just, you know, put in the hours and stuff, and you, you'll find there are three or four people who become impassioned and never stop talking about it, ever. Um, and they do a really good job. Um, on a plus note, I just got back from India, and I was teaching kids how to build little models of wind turbines, and I used your model um, to build little ones out of plastic bottles and um, teach kids about it. And it's fascinating when a child understands that you can generate electricity. Um, and if I go back this summer, I'll teach them how to take it off a dynamo and stuff. But it's, uh, yeah, it's a really interesting project, and I think everyone found it fascinating. So, thank you. Next up, we have Sheffield, represented by myself this time. So here's, here's how we got to at the end of the first year. We built this wind turbine, we had the help of the lovely V3. They turned up with their van full of just about everything you need to build a wind turbine, right up to our doorstep. And uh, we had our first day, our first workshop, building these blades here. Uh, later in the year, we also did a, a uh, generator building session where we cast a stator and the rotor. 
Unfortunately, I wasn't able to attend that, but from all accounts, that was equally as fun as the first time, although we had a few less people attend, so the important lesson that we learned there is make sure the events are all publicised properly, and if possible, get people to sign up beforehand. And this is at a festival in Sheffield called Peace in the Park. Uh, this is the first year we had it there. It's pretty desolate around. The second year, we were part of a big contingent on the top field, and it really felt like we were a lot more part of the festival. So this is what we did in the summer um, after this first year. Um, me, Niels Kampman, who's in the audience over there, um, trying not to get my gaze, thank you, um, and two other engineers went to Guatemala and we ignored the advice in Hughes' book that says do not use vertical axis wind turbines because they're not very efficient. And we built one and it wasn't very efficient. <laughs> yeah. The aim was to continue the project as a, to build like a, a lasting link that would uh, keep going throughout four, five, maybe six years, but we've kind of decided that maybe wind power isn't the best for, for the NGO that we were working with. Their specialism is, is uh, pedal power. The wind resource in that area isn't that great. That's something we also didn't check out. So I guess the big lesson to learn from this is before you go head first into an international project, do your homework. Don't try and reinvent the wheel as we did. Uh, this is an outreach workshop we won. So the details of this, I don't think we have on our website yet, but hopefully we will be putting up there shortly. So if anyone's interested in running a simple workshop around wind power, all you need to do this one is a few sheets of newspaper, some sellotape, a kitchen roll tube is cut along its axis to produce the blades, a wine bottle cork and a small motor that you can buy for one or two pounds from any kind of reasonable electronics, online electronics store. <coughs> And this is another wind turbine designer who in fact met with Hugh about eight years ago. And we have his turbine up here. I'm going to zap it with a laser. Yeah, that's it. So it's a lot smaller machine, a lot flimsier. Um, it's not been tested by anywhere near the same uh, extent that Hugh's machines have. So in terms of a machine for reliably producing power and generating electricity where there is none, perhaps it's not so appropriate. But for an educational project, it absolutely is. And the fact that we could bring this one here today to show you all, uh, but we couldn't bring our heavier machine that was built to huge design, again proves that it does have a, a role to play. Um, our bigger machine has sat in the cupboard gathering dust, as Tom said, it absolutely shouldn't, because of the very fact that we didn't have a plan with what to do, of what to do with it in the start. Um, if, if you're thinking that you don't ever want to install your wind turbine anywhere, you just want to have fun building it and then you want to take it around to different places as a kind of an educational tool then I would recommend one of these machines. Um, if you want to install your wind turbine somewhere and you want a reliable machine that's going to actually produce a decent quantity of electricity, um, well I mean by decent quantity, um, maybe not enough to make you super rich but enough to be worth plugging into the grid, then I'd absolutely recommend going for one of Hugh's machines. Our plan for this year is to install it in an educational trust called Wurlow Hall Farm on the outskirts of Sheffield and we haven't even started looking for planning permission so perhaps this is another hurdle that we'll fall into. So next up, can we have EWB Warwick please? Uh, I'm much the same as the other branches. I mean, we started building it in the beginning of 2010. Um, we did the course over two weekends, uh, but we didn't quite finish it. I mean, we were doing it with V3, so they took it away and helped, well, finished it for us. Um, and all that while, we had planning permission going through, and we finally got it installed uh, later that year in October. Um, planning permission was a pain, as you can see from the other branches. I mean, we got permission, but because we had the turbine situated down by some sport pitches. Sport England put in an objection and just said basically it's going to disrupt the wind and our rugby balls are going to go all over the place. <laughs> so obviously the council has to take that into account and so it all went. Um, I mean, one guy decided to do some fluid dynamic analysis and to prove to them basically that what they were saying was crap. Um, <laughs> so eventually <laughs> we got the permission, we got it up, but Unfortunately, we didn't quite know what we were doing with V3 gun, and uh, we dropped it a month later, taking it down for maintenance. But it's fixed again, back up and running, um, producing a 
the total it's not producing much, but yeah, we're looking to get it producing more. Um, I mean, up to sort of standards it should be doing, um, just to show people that it's a viable option. It's not the best location for trees and things, but that's it's all we could get with the planning permission. Um, yeah, it was a really good, really, really, really good project. Uh, definitely recommend it to any branch looking to the project. It was the first project we did as a new branch, um, and it's definitely ongoing. I mean, it's not build it, get it up, it's maintain it. Um, so it's an ongoing project. Definitely. this time to all our EWB branch members that have been kind enough to share their experiences with us. The next part of the, the session is an open-ended discussion. Um, we're going to have questions from anyone that would like to ask one um, to the panel or to even any of the branch members that have just come up and presented. Um, as the organiser of this session, I'm going to take the liberty to ask the first question. As a, an engineer and as a researcher, I'd really like to be able to make a, a contribution to the technology. Um, what do you see as the, the key ways in that members of Engineers Without Borders can get involved and can really address the challenges that are currently facing the technology? All small wind turbines is reliability. Um, and if we're talking about the developing world, um, you also have to have accessibility of materials. So I would say if, if you're looking for a service that will really make a difference, then you should go out and look at what fails the most, whether it be bearings or whether it be corrosion or what are, what are the biggest reliability problems um, with the turbines, and then find a solution that doesn't involve spending thousands of dollars on some super duper um, piece of equipment or, or getting some sort of amazing epoxy resin that's just been invented and that you can't buy outside the USA. Sort of thing. Um, that's really the challenge, I would say. Um, it's as you've seen, it's uh, it's a lot of fun to get something working, but keeping it working is more important because the energy is not just power; it's power multiplied by hours. And so, you've got to get those hours in. You've got to get the reliability, and that's the real engineering challenge, as far as I'm concerned. What would you say are the biggest issues with reliability? Why do most of what, why do most small wind turbines fail? That's an eternal puzzle. I've puzzled over that for decades. But I'd, um, I'd, I think that there is something to be said for doing some um, research into the failure patterns. Um, often, of course, it's human error, um, but there will be technical issues in there to do with, um, as I say, corrosion and bearings, um, lightning protection of rectifiers. Um, there'll be certain failures that, that you'll find coming up over and over again. Um, where a uh, fix or a better understanding of the problem and its solutions um, would lead to better reliability. Thank you. So do we have any more questions? Yes, I think you had your hand up first. Um, yeah, it's uh, yeah, a little bit of a, a convoluted story. Um, Basically, um, yeah. Um, so uh, Drew had already applied for some funding um, for putting up another wind turbine, uh, actually two wind turbines, and to finish off the project, the water pumping system that you saw there. Um, now, that was for about seventy thousand US dollars, and it needed to get approval from two different government departments. And we'd actually got approval, and it was going to. Uh, supply parts for to finish off one project and doing another project, water pumping, uh, wind power, water pumping system. Um, but it had been seen as it went through one of the government departments, it was seen that this is quite a lot of money and where's it going. It was actually paid for by the uh, Anti Poverty Commission, the Filipino Anti Poverty Commission. So the government's money was going out um, for this. Um, it had to be approved by one of the departments. Um, I shouldn't say which department, um, and then they wouldn't allow it to be approved. They said, we can do this ourselves. Uh, they took the projects from us, um, and they wouldn't allow us to get approval for it. Um, they then used their, they put their projects out to tender to people that they knew, basically corruption, and uh, eventually one of the people, um, uh, it was obviously very related to the um, 
government official that could perhaps do the signature. Um, he, he got the contracts and uh, they installed diesel-based water pumping systems. Um, the uh, government department was allowed to take 40% of the money just for operational costs, and that's part of it. That's how it worked. So they took 40% of the money, and then these other groups. Um, they did install a diesel-powered water pumping system, um, plonked it right next to our pump. Um, didn't talk to us at all about how to connect it. Um, diesel's incredibly expensive there. It had a full tank of diesel, and if you drained that, and now it's not used at all because diesel's too expensive. So, um, yeah, that's what happened with that. I don't know where the rest of the money went, actually, um, but it was all lost, all because of political. Um, uh, yeah, um, it's, it's knowing the political situation um, and actually having people who, not, who understand it. Um, like me as a total outsider, didn't understand or how it worked. Um, but maybe I should have done some more research on that. But yeah, um, it was a bit depressing. Maybe trying to get money from other sources. Maybe don't trust government money. I don't know. Do we have one over here? Yeah. Um, the BBC piping is incredibly simple and they broke really easy to sort of rebuild. What kind of scale can you build those up to before you have to transition to sort of wood or fiberglass system? So I think it partly depends on what kind of size pipe you can find. Um, the biggest pipe I've seen is about this kind of section, but the bigger you get, the, the less available it is. I've not done any kind of strength calculations on how much force they could withstand, and I guess that depends on how fast they're spinning around as well. I don't know, Hugh, have you ever built one of these PVC machines? I've, I've never actually cut plates out of a piece of PVC pipe, although it's a very popular technique. Um, I believe it's uh, not possible to achieve the same lift to drag ratio, so you have to settle for a much lower RPM on the machine. Um, also, PVC does have less attractive structural and fatigue properties than wood, but uh, it, it, it certainly speeds the process up. People do find that they can make them in, in a tiny fraction of the time it takes to make wooden ones, so uh, that's the trade-off that you're looking at, as far as I know. Um, I think if you were building something larger, then it would be more attractive to make it more aerodynamic, because it would, the larger you build something, the payoff in terms of the energy, etc., is much greater the trouble that you put into it, so it's worth putting some trouble into it, whereas something that was crude and large would, would have been a waste of effort, really, in terms of the rest of the system. Yeah, there's a lot of money that goes into the, the alternators in terms of copper and magnets, so to waste it all with inefficient blades does seem definitely a silly decision to make. And kind of going back to your point about fiberglass, uh, if you're building a one-off machine, then wood is almost certainly the best way to go. You can just get a plank of wood, carve it out really easy. Fiberglass, you need moulds, and in order to make moulds, you, you have to make a blade first, and that's a blank, and you probably make that out of wood. So once you're manufacturing sort of probably 10 or more wind turbines, then fiberglass may start to become more of an attractive option. But for one-offs, for a, an Engineers Without Borders style project, then, would you agree that wood is yeah, well the best I, option? I would say don't don't um, don't undertake fiberglass manufacture lightly because uh, I've seen a lot of failures in fiberglass blades. I've seen very few failures in wooden blades. Um, trees are made out of wood, and that's for a good reason. It's the perfect material for that sort of application. But there's a lot of bending. You need something light and strong, fatigue resistant, and, and it's a brilliant material for that. Fiberglass, correctly applied, um, can work very well. But uh, making the thing hang together is much more difficult people assume. So it's certainly not a shortcut but for manufacturing um, large batches or mass production. It, it does make a lot of sense to use composite materials. Can I uh, just add to that? Yeah, one thing I didn't mention is, um, uh, I, I would totally agree with that. Um, in the Philippines we were actually making fiberglass blades. Um, a bit strange for a place which has quite a lot of trees. Um, but it was seen that the um, the wood that was available was not um, of the correct sort or suitable, um, nor amazingly sustainably harvested um, for making blades. We were also looking at kind of doing long-term production, so we were actually building the blades out of fiberglass, but we did have a lot of problems with them. Um, yeah, I'd say definitely go for wood. Yeah. And the, so you produced a manual, was it? Uh, yeah, there is a, a manual. Um, there was some work done in Peru. Uh, was it Peru? I think they, the Practical Action has a manual from Peru about. Plus, and I you know, expanded that from the work that Drew and I did. Uh, 
that's available. It's available online, yes, it's a very detailed document. I just want to add one more thing. In terms of transferring the technology, Wood's perfect because anywhere you go, there's going to normally be a skilled carpenter, and you just have to show them how to make the blade once, and then they um, know how to do it. They can replicate it very easily. Uh, with fiberglass, obviously, you need a bit more skill. So, James, would you like to say anything about the Windows choice of, of blade materials? Um, Just to give you an introduction, so James has worked for Windows in Peru for two and a half years and was involved in the design of their blades which use a foam core and a fiberglass outer which is covered then by a layer of carbon fibre. Yeah, you have a foam core which means that instead of using solid resin it's significantly lighter and a layer of fiberglass and a layer of carbon fibre. Um, the idea was that it provides, in theory, a more professionally manufactured product. And if the blades are lighter and more aerodynamic, then you get improved efficiencies. But these blades cost maybe $200 each to make, and a wooden one costs a fraction of that. So it's got to be worthwhile. And we made maybe 200 before we got some that worked quite well. There's a graveyard of blades uh, in Peru somewhere. Um, they do have the benefits if you can master it, but it's a very difficult skill to get right. But as you say, wood can be, you can train someone locally to make one out of wood. It's a bit more difficult to make them make one out of fiberglass and carbon fibre. And then you've got a whole new level of health and safety problems as well associated with it. So I guess it depends what your aim are, aims are. Are you trying to, are you trying to build local capacity, teach local people to make wind turbines and then build a sustainable livelihood? Or are you trying to get the best quality machine that you can? Do you have a question, Andrew? Yeah, I was children um, of a younger age and then communities to understand technology then they're more likely to accept it, be trained, be able to build blades, if they understand what it does. Um, so I was just in India for three weeks just doing a bit of testing with their school that I worked with a few years ago. Um, but the project's part of a much larger project which we're starting in the north eastern branches, um, which I'm sure you might hear a bit about with that. Thank you. Do you have any more questions? Yes. Um, 
make it sustainable. Um, but that's, that's my take on that. <coughs> Just to add to that, you mentioned clear energy. Um, they're actually now not continuing to produce wind turbines. Um, they've had a lot of problems with the community not feeling engaged in the process, not feeling like they were really part of it and therefore not being able to maintain it because they didn't have the, the skills in the first place. Even though they it had a, a training program, they've recently done another project in partnership with another NGO called Asso Phoenix. And in that project, members of the community in which they were going to install the wind turbine actively took part in the construction process and therefore learned a lot more just as, as we have when we built one of Hughes' machines ourselves. We've learned the ins and outs of the design and we know exactly what to do when something goes wrong. And to date, that project has been far more successful. Yeah, um, I think you're totally right there. The long-term sustainability of these projects is, is key with, with all of these projects. And there is, um, it does happen a lot. Um, that things are installed and then it's kind of forgotten about. And because it was that one person's kind of idea and then they've gone, the skills transfer hasn't really happened. Um, it's very difficult to address that. Um, I spent a lot of my time trying to make, uh, to try to document everything um, to manuals and documentation. Although it's quite boring, I think it's really useful for the kind of long-term um, sustainability of all these projects. Um, and I think that's kind of the key to all of these projects. They should be documented well, and, and also training is given um, as much as possible, um, so everyone knows what's going on. One thing that does happen in a um, certainly in the NGO that I was, a lot of people were there to get a small amount of uh, some skills working, um, doing anything, and then people would actually travel abroad to make more money. Now in the Philippines, an engineer would make about four pounds a day. You can go to Dubai and make you know, $60 a day, and that's why everyone would just leave to, to do that. So there is actually, you train up people, but very quickly people leave, especially people with the key skills. It's quite difficult to maintain that. I think the only way really is to have a long-term, um, someone who's there for a long time in that area, uh, or an NGO that's fully behind it. grid's already there, um, although it, it takes away from you being able to fix that lovely shiny grid tie inverter box um, with your sort of own, own local technicians, it is just going to be a slightly more sustainable and embodied energy wise as well, lead acid batteries, the Victorian technology, um, it's very very well recycled, um, most batteries will become batteries again but the energy it takes to do that um, is pretty disastrous and, and you might find you're just constantly just, just about keeping up with the energy it took to make your batteries every time you replace them. So if the grid's there, um, we generally would recommend putting it in. But it does then not allow you to fix it without um, an inverter is a complicated box of electronics. Yes? Um, I know we are a lot at the electrical sort of thing, but I don't know what's at the mechanical So for water pumping? Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you had a water pump right now, but was that an electric um, pump powered by a diesel wind turbine? Yeah, one of the systems there, it was pumping water, but it was actually um, uh, electricity generation um, 
so they could do a few other things as well. Um, quite interesting, it, it, the solar panels were mounted on, uh, they did in, install a water pumping system, so generally for water pumping you need more torque but it doesn't need to spin as fast, for electricity generation you use fewer blades and it spins as fast. Um, so they, they'd installed, um, someone had been there, I think it was a, a missionary had been there and installed a water pumping system and I think it lasted eight hours before it blew down. Um, because strong winds, um, yeah. Um, so maybe that, that was also hit by a typhoon, so maybe we should have learned from the fact that we were putting our solar panels on the broken frame of an old wind turbine system. Uh, the clues are there, something happened. Anyway, um, yeah, so um, our experience was with using electricity to then run a water pump. Maybe not the most sensible way of doing it. It made it a little bit easier to, to configure. Um, and also we could use that energy for other things. We also had solar power, it was a hybrid system, so it had both wind and solar, um, which was quite useful to even out things throughout the year. But yeah, I, I can't say it was the best choice for that particular location. Okay, I've got another question I'd like to ask. Um, as part of the research that I've been doing, I found out that there are over 100,000 small wind generators in Inner Mongolia, and they're manufactured within Inner Mongolia itself, at the autonomous region in China. Um, this is a, a huge level of dissemination for the technology, and I was wondering, Hugh, do you think there is any way that your technology can ever reach this level of dissemination? And if so, what are the key, bar key barriers that are presenting it, preventing it from doing so at the moment? Well, I think it's a chicken and egg situation in the sense that you do have to have an understanding of the technology before it can be successful be understood until it's quite widespread. Um, so I think that, that to get over that hump, you have to have a lot of incentive coming from the state, presumably in the case of Mongolia, presumably coming from the Chinese. Um, and uh, that's not a problem that's going to be solved by a technical fix or even by a social fix on a small scale. Um, I think it, it probably does need a, a massive push to a, a, a launch. Work. And obviously in Mongolia you've got a, an ideal situation where you've got a lot of um, people who are nomadic, so therefore they're obviously off-grid and it's also a very windy country. Um, so that makes it very worthwhile, whether you would ever have the critical mass to justify the investment um, in other locations in the world is, is questionable because the, the places where wind is competitive and so you need really tend to be very localized coastal regions or in mountainous regions or whatever localized high wind but in answer to the original question, I would say that it's a, it's, a, it's a matter of pushing the technology, pushing the application of the technology through that barrier of, of um, recognition and familiarity. Hopefully that's something wind empowerment will be able to help with as well, and something that everyone here can get involved in. The more turbines we build, the more we learn about them, and the more research projects there are on them, they, the more advanced the technology becomes. And the, the more reliable the machines become and the more likely they are to be able to get to that critical mass whereby they can start to really make a difference to a significant number of people. So do we have any more questions? Yes? Um, in terms of the design, what's the most expensive and which would get part of it? I mean, um, for uh, an EOD branch to take the project of the particular area, Since then, I've learned that they're very vulnerable, actually, 
the Burgo plated. Um, the plating is not particularly robust and uh, you'll very often run into corrosion problems with these very expensive magnets quite early on and it's a bit of a nightmare. Um, so I would say that if it was a case of making the machine better adapted for the developing world, more robust, cheaper, um, that uh, uh, really we should be looking at using the older ferrite or ceramic magnets um, and uh, adapting the design to that. That, that, would, that would be, to my mind, an urgent priority for, for making the design more uh, third world proof, if you like, um, and less expensive. As I say, I'm not sure if that's an answer to the question, but I'm glad I got the opportunity to say that. <laughs> Add a bit to that. And, um, it's quite weird how uh, um, here building wind turbine, the labour costs are a, a big part of that. You know, if you're going to get something welded up, a day's labour doing that um, would cost quite a lot of money. Whereas uh, kind of the electronics and that kind of system uh, was all much cheaper. In the Philippines, that's reversed. So the electronics is incredibly expensive, a lot of it imported. Even though a lot of it's manufactured there, it then is re-imported. Um, the magnets um, cost a fortune to get imported. Um, another level of corruption they had to get through shipping, being shipped in and customers because uh, they were holding them to make a bit more money. Um, so the big costs for the turbines that we were doing um, in the Philippines were the magnets and the charge regulators and inverters because they all generally came from America. Somewhere like that. Whereas over here it probably would be reversed. So. so now that you've heard all this, I'm hoping that some of you will be wondering, how can you get involved, or how can I get involved? Well, the obvious way is to build a wind turbine in your own university. There's various ways to go about that. The, the first way, I highly recommend buying a huge recipe book. Um, you can buy it from scoregwind.com? Is it dot .com or dot? .com or dot Okay, just type in Hugh into Google and it will pop up. Um, you can get V3 Power down. A number of branches, including Sheffield, have really enjoyed having you guys come there and make the process a lot easier for us. Um, they do an excellent job and charge a very reasonable price as well. And you can also invite John Simnett, who's the designer of this machine. If you're thinking that you want to use it for outreach purposes, if you want to display it in the university, it's a much cheaper machine and we can provide you with his contact details afterwards. Um, you can also develop the technology yourself through an academic project. Um, I'm doing my PhD on this kind of technology now. Um, as we just talked about, an um, interesting academic project would be what is the difference in the performance of a machine, the cost of a machine, the sustainability of a machine that uses different types of magnets in the stator. Um, you could also, or oh, in the rotor, sorry. Um, you can also run a wind power outreach workshop. So the details of the one that we designed at Sheffield are going to be up on the internet, going to be available. Um, the, I believe Warwick also ran one of those as well. Is that true? Did Warwick, Warwick also did an outreach yeah, we workshop? Did, um, we, wasn't, we didn't use it for outreach, we just did a workshop with uh, students who built mini wind turbines out of magnets, wind coils, and PVC blades. Um, and we did it at the smallest festival as well. Ah, okay. So, are the details for that on, on the internet? We didn't design it, we got the information from a link on Hugh's page. Got wind. Got wind. Got wind. Um, dot com. Something like that. Okay. Um, we basically adapted that design. We don't have any information about it. We use that. Okay. So again, look on the Hughes web page. It's a gold mine of information. Uh, volunteer placements. James Lowe is here from Wind Empowerment and Wind Aid. They run volunteer placements. Um, I know a number of branches. I think Warwick as well are thinking of doing a volunteer placement this summer. But something to really bear in mind is how is your wind turbine going to perform after you've installed it? Is it still going to be there in 10 years' time? Is it still going to be providing that same amount of electricity as it was the moment you put it up? Um, EWB UK also have a number of placements with Sabat. They deal with wind energy. And there's a number of other small-scale renewable projects that EWB UK run, and we will find out about shortly in their placements launch. So, can I just have a show of hands? How many people here have been involved with building a wind turbine? And how many people are now interested in building a wind turbine? Ah, that's great. Okay, well, you know, you know who to talk to. 
Um, we'll be putting something on the EWB UK website about the new community of practice as well. I do really urge you to check out Hugh's website, b 3 Power's website, and Wind Empowerment's website. Um, just Google them all and you'll find them. So thank you very much for listening. And uh, thank you very much to our panel. And thank you to our EWB branch members for sharing their experiences. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thanks.